Dr. Balchandran, who's got me all three, and the distinguished audience, which is uh, very evidently here, many of whom I have known as being leaders of business education. Thank you very much for asking me to come here and let me apologize for delaying the start by a few minutes. I've often wondered what these conferences uh, lead to. We have uh, no lack of conferences in India. And uh, I wonder whether at the end of the conference and subsequently before the next conference is held, we evaluate the results of the conference and what it has led to in terms of any kind of improvement in whatever it was supposed to improve. And uh, I may be totally wrong, but my impression is that by and large, these conferences don't lead to any significant changes or improvements in whichever field the conference has been held in. Of course, there's a great number of other benefits. People get to meet each other, their network building, there's a lot of interchange of knowledge and all of that. But in terms of uh, improvement in things, I'm not sure what it leads to. Mr. Agnihotri just mentioned, for example, uh, the main cornerstone stakeholders of uh, business education. I don't know if I missed hearing him or whether he did say. I didn't hear him say that uh, the users of the products from the business schools who are industry and uh, business, whether it's in the services sector or in the industrial sector or government sector anyway, where they come in as stakeholders or not. Because it's very well for MHA, MHA Ministry of uh, uh, Education and the ICT and universities and all to the stakeholders. But they're not the users of the product. And if you're not having a regular interaction with the user of the product, is there not a danger of your neglecting or not understanding what the market really wants and orienting your products to see, meet that market requirement. Because the first thing that I understood when I started away from government into getting into business uh, uh, arena was that the most important thing that one must do is to understand what the customer wants. And if you don't uh, worry about the customer and you continue to do what you're doing without uh, looking at the customer's needs, then maybe you will go very wrong at to some stage. And when you talk about uh, the large number of vacant seats in business schools, I would submit that it is because the products coming out of these business schools are not meeting the expectations and the needs of the users. It's that simple. If they met the needs, they wouldn't be there. The industry still says that they lack managers. There's a huge attrition whenever there's even a slight spurt in the growth of the economy. Attrition level reach 18%, 20%, which shows that there's a shortage of people. And yet you say they are vacant seats. So there is obviously a disconnect between the kind of products which are being produced and the kind of product which uh, industry and business want. And I think that's the question that you should address. And I would submit that the real cornerstone of the stakeholder, the stakeholder who really matters for business education, are the users of the products of business education. And in fact, the talk which I had uh, written on for today basically deals with that theme. I have submitted that the content and objectives of business education must primarily relate to meeting the needs of the economy of that country. Not what government bodies want or what academic bodies want, but what the economy of the country needs and which is the users. The environment for economic growth and the culture of the people is never identical amongst countries. The managers of the economy, even have they've been education, educated based on experiences of another country, which is generally the case in India, must understand the need to understand, to adjust to local conditions if they want to be successful. You cannot transplant learnings and practices 
or one geography to another. It doesn't work. It has also been realized that the economy of a country, especially one which is transforming itself from an underdeveloped economy to a much more developed economy, will not be static. Conditions will keep changing rapidly. Change is taking place continuously, and the education system, particularly business education, must be able to adjust to the changing conditions. You must introspect and see if this is happening, whether over the last 50 years or so that we have had the start of uh, organized business education in India, our business schools are constantly reviewing what is happening to the economic environment, the social environment, the political environment in this country, and adjusting their syllabus and training and courses to meet those changes. I, I'm not sure that's happening. It is my experience of what I have, what little, I'm not an educationist, so please forgive me if I say the wrong things. But my little experience hasn't shown me that that is actually happening. The Indian economy today is vastly different from what it was at the time of independence. It has not only grown in size and complexity, but it has changed in many other ways. When we started, we decided that we would be guided by socialistic principles, there would be planned economic development, we would follow more or less the Soviet model. We based our industrial development within the framework of a policy of self-reliance, import substitution, and exports were not a priority item. Foreign investments were strictly controlled for many reasons, including shortage of foreign exchange, and domestic industry was protected not only from external competition, but through import controls, also largely from domestic competition. The whole framework of licenses and regulations determined how industries were to be set up and operated and what was to be done. Import of technology was obviously very, very restricted and controlled. So were imports for industry, because you have the DGTD and all kinds of licensing and things to get anything imported into that country at that time. Many of the young people today don't even know what was happening in those days. While the private sector had a place in our economy, Policy dictated that the public sector should control the commanding heights. Thus a huge public sector developed after 1950. Heavy and strategic industries, all infrastructure including banks, insurance, coal mining and so on, were in the public sector. Even if they were not at the start, they came under the public sector. This situation changed dramatically after 1991. We moved to a competitive and market-determined economic situation. Large segments of our industry were transformed from the license raj to an open competitive. Entry barriers mostly came down except for a few areas. Central government controls policy relating to development only a few industries. Much of the action for manufacturing is now not taking place in Udyog Bhavan or the corridors of the DGTD or anybody like that, was taking place in the state governments. <coughs> Foreign direct investment is now encouraged as against the earlier policy of discouragement. It's allowed up to 100% in many industries. There are of course some areas where there are restrictions on uh, foreign investment. However, the change from export, import policies, import substitution to exports is very marked. Our exports have cost $300 billion last year, something which we couldn't have dreamt of 20 years ago. And global barriers to trade have come down, which have created the opportunities for exports and cheaper imports. As a result, for many years, we averaged a GDP growth of near 5%, or 9% till the global economic crisis set us back and then we had our own problems. Now, when we started business education and Calcutta and Ahmedabad were the earliest to start, they started with 
collaboration and know-how coming from two leading American universities, the business schools, which was appropriate because at that time we didn't have much knowledge in that area and we needed somebody to mentor us. Something which we are doing to do even with the new IIM, but we don't, didn't know how to start in Ranchi. So we got Calcutta to mentor us. So the same thing happened in 19, uh, what was it, 50, something 60, 60, 61 when we started. Subsequently to the uh, initial number of IIMs who came up in a few years, there's a gap. And then we have now recently added another six new IIMs and there are 13 of them. In the private sector, business schools have also started as demand for good education increased. And it was thought that the business schools and the business education which was given based on the experience of the IIMs, that that was very useful for business and industry. And so the demand for these, uh, the people from these product uh, institutes started to increase. And uh, as was mentioned today, there are about 3,500 or 3,600 business schools. Whether the economy needs that number of uh, schools, whether we need three and a half lakh seats of business schools, I don't know. I don't know what is the study done or what is the market survey done to determine what is the real demand for MBAs in the country. Even if you were growing at 8% to 9%, what is the real demand? I actually, I have no clue and I haven't seen Anywhere, any study which says that this country needs 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 MBAs. We produce about, again, you can correct me if I think this is just a rough figure, about a quarter of the total MBAs of the entire world. Our economy, in terms of either employment or capital or anything, would be what? 5% of the global world or something close to that? 6? Okay, 6% six so slightly. And we produce 25% of the MBAs. Isn't there some kind of uh, disconnect in those numbers? I'm, I'm just putting this before you to consider that given the size of our business and industry and given the size of the MBAs we produce, what is the logic there? I'm not sure. Now, we did grow at 9% a year. We did have, we have had a slowdown, but hopefully we will continue, we will get back to our 9% growth because we need that if this country is going to have, or is going to solve this problem of unemployment, and if we are going to have reasonable social stability in the system. Because large unemployment today in conditions of rising expectations, the media creates vast awareness of what's happening uh, in all parts of the country and the world. And the young people today are much more aware of what is possible and what they should have than what was the situation 20 years ago. That's a fact which I think needs to be understood, not only in the education system, but by everybody, including people in industry and business that the aspirations, the expectations, the knowledge levels of the young people today are very, very different. And if we do not provide adequate employment to them, the results would be something which none of us would like to think about. So that's something which we need to worry about. But what are the constraints which we experienced when growth was at that 9%? And that, I think, should tell us something about what we need to do. At that time when we were growing at 9%, the growth was essentially led by the services sector. Agriculture, which employs about 50% of the workforce of this country, contributes only 14% of the GDP. Clearly there is something very wrong in this happening, either the number of workers has to reduce or the contribution of agriculture must go up, otherwise this gap between the haves and the have-nots will only increase and that will create a lot of social tensions. Industry has continued to grow but roughly at the same rate as the GDP and its share in the GDP has remained between 15-16% percent 
for the last two, three decades, uh, and that has not grown faster. It's the services sector which has led that growth of 9% in the total economy. In future, the growth of the services sector cannot continue to lead the growth of the economy. Global competition is growing, the margins are coming down, we don't have a technology uh, development in India which is basically product based, it's largely based on providing services and manpower and the growth of that is slowing down, we have seen Infosys has slowed down considerably, other things are slowing down, it's not going to be what it used to be. You cannot have sustainable 9% in the future in the expectation that the services sector will lead our growth. We are not at that stage. Not only that, this large young population, we pride ourselves on our demographic, demographic dividend and what's happening. But it's very well to talk of demographic, but what is going to happen to these young people? Where are they going to be employed? The people who are coming from the villages cannot be all employed in the services sector. Most of them have to be employed as blue-collar workers, which means what? Manufacturing. There is no option for a country like us not to go into manufacturing. You see what uh, many of the developed countries today, which are developed, have done in the past in growing. Japan grew on the basis of its manufacturing. It did not grow on the services sector, it grew on manufacturing. Korea did exactly the same. China has done exactly the same. Singapore, Thailand, all these countries have grown their manufacturing sector and it ranges between 30 and 40 percent of the GDP. We have remained at 15, 16 percent. And I think that should send warning signals to everybody that something is not sustainable in what we are doing. It has been good while it lasted, but look at what's happening in the future and I think the uh, evidence of the last few years is showing that we are slowing down and there's very little hope that it's going to grow in the future. Where will foreign exchange come from? That's another thing which you have to worry about. The cost of oil imports, energy imports is going to grow. We have to meet that. The government of India recognized this and as you know a new manufacturing policy has been framed, included in the 12th plan and it has many contents but the main object of that policy is that in the next 10 years the share of manufacturing should go up from the existing 15-16% to 25% of the GDP. Very ambitious target, requires manufacturing to grow at at least 3 to 4 percent faster than the GDP growth, it's not happening. And therefore, it's very, very important to look at constraints. There are many constraints we know about infrastructure, technology, and all those things. I'm not going to talk about that. But during the time of growth of 9 percent, even that time, a major constraint was the availability of human resources. And I would submit to you that the most critical factor for the growth of industrial manufacturing has been, is and will always be human resources. If you have people who are motivated, if you have people who are well educated, if you have people who think and not only just are comfortable repeating what somebody else has done, then you will get innovation, you will get change, you will get development, all the things that happen. And it boils down to what kind of human resources will become available for the development of the economy. And that's where you gentlemen have a really, really critical role to play because the people you produce are going to determine what happens in the economy. It's not going to be import of technology, it's not going to be RBI reducing interest rates, it's not going to be some reform which the government can get done. It's going to be people. Many countries have shown that all kinds of obstacles which look to be unsurmountable get taken care of if you have the people. 
we need to look at skill development. We need to look at people who are equipped to deal with business. We need to look at engineers. When we talked about uh, this uh, study which was done by Meritrack, which came in papers in the last couple of days, it's not something which is a big surprise to any of us who have been in the industry. You know how difficult it is to hire the right people. And it's not only in MBAs. It applies equally to engineering graduates. It applies equally to normal uh, commerce or economic graduates. The quality of education in this country has not kept pace with the requirements of the economy. And we need to pay serious attention to how to improve the economy. <coughs> Let me come to another point. One of the characteristics of our whole development has been that while we prepare excellent plans and strategies, their implementation usually falls short of what is expected. We are very good planners, not so good implementers. And if you look at the shortfalls which we had, the time overruns, the cost overruns in projects in the public sector, you'll see what I'm talking about. The larger and well-managed public, uh, private sector companies do manage to do their projects and uh, works on time and they operate their industries efficiently also. But that's only a limited number of people who are able to get good manpower to come to. The bulk of Indian SMEs, let's say, because they constitute the bulk of industry today, not characterized by the ability to deliver on time, maintain commitments, and to maintain quality. I can say this from our personal experience of over 30 years. We have worked with all the suppliers, and there are hundreds of them. And I can assure you that it's an uphill struggle all the time and why is that so? Because basically people. You approve a sample, you approve a process, you get it going. You find after six months somebody has changed something, somebody is doing something differently, it will not do it this way it, should, it was supposed to be done. What does it mean? It's nothing to do with the machine, it's to do with the people. So that when I say that people are most critical, that's what I mean, that to maintain quality, to maintain your time schedules, to maintain your commitments, it's people who do it, not the machines. So, we need to see how to get people educated. Most of the output from the top 25 business schools, you know, those 25 uh, business schools today produce people who are well educated, people who are amongst the I would say the most talented young people who are coming into the mainstream of uh, life. And those people generally do not join the manufacturing sector. This was not true till about 20 odd years ago. I remember in BHEL and in, in the initial years of Maruti, we used to get people coming to us from IITs and from IIM. Not so today. Because opportunities in the services, financial and technology sectors grew, became much more lucrative, manufacturing could not match them, lost a set MNCs also found that the products of these business schools are immensely attractive to them because they come at lower cost and they're willing to work very hard, they're very bright guys, well educated, and uh, they, they find that uh, why not recruit a lot of Indians? You see how many Indians from our uh, top schools today find jobs in uh, uh, Goldman Sachs and McKinsey's and such things. So that's what's happening. It's good for those people. I'm not sure how good it is for the Indian economy. So, the manufacturing sector, by and large, does without the products of the top business schools, the very educated people. Government sector has totally lost its attractiveness for anybody coming from any of the uh, better business schools. 
and the agriculture, infrastructure, social services sector do not get the benefit of good people. And that explains why our implementation in all these areas is not up to the mark, because you don't have the right kind of people. So what to do? Obviously, you can't suddenly improve the quality of education. You don't have the teachers. Even the best of IMs today have a problem in getting adequate faculty. Fortunately, technology makes it possible to get the same results as you would get if you had 100 times the number of faculty, good faculty which you have today. The multiplier effect of technology today has not been used in India at all. Many Western countries are making increasing investments in making sure that they can use technology to upgrade the quality of education. I think more than anybody else, India needs to do that. It will reduce the cost of education, it will increase the quality of education, the number of well-educated people coming out would increase substantially. And my submission is if this number increases, then besides the services sector, which of course will still get what it wants, the other sectors I talked about will get the overflow. You may not need 350,000 seats, but the number of uh, schools which you upgrade will depend on the mar market requirement of the users. But the ability to well-educated students who match the requirements of the business and industry is really what the key requirement is. And that is what I think by interacting with business, interacting with government, you have to see how it can be solved. Our education system, especially in engineering colleges and even in the business schools, the best business schools, does not encourage their products to actually get hands-on experience of work. Most of these people prefer the sector they go to because they can sit in air-conditioned offices, they don't have to go out into the field to learn what's happening. The work is all done on paper, very little hands-on experience. If you want to improve implementation, we need hands-on experience. There's no substitute for hands-on experience. And I think the education system has to create the kind of value that people are willing to do hands-on experience. We have to relook at our education content. I'm talking again of business schools primarily. Is the American system designed to meet the needs of the American economy, which is financial sector, services sector oriented, appropriate for us. How do we give it the greater orientation towards manufacturing? Because that is what today the economy wants. The manufacturing sector has to grow faster than anything else. Where are the people? How do we produce the people? Is it not something which business schools should worry about? That this is what the economy needs. Are we doing our job in meeting these needs? And I think that's something which needs to be looked at, just not following that, oh, the Harvard does this and Kellogg does this and therefore I should do it because they are the best schools in the world. They're the best schools for the American economy. They're not the best schools for the Indian economy. And I think that has to be understood. So my, in conclusion, my, uh, my recommendation is that business education must review what it does in the context of the changes which have taken place in the Indian economy. It must see how it can reorient itself to meet the current needs of the Indian economy and keep changing as it goes along. The delivery system for the education system must improve, must use technology extensively so that the quality of education can be improved, the costs can be lowered. We are approaching the costs of uh, Western education. We can't afford it. And so something has to be done on that. So if we do that, create the appropriate value systems in the students whom we educate, they understand the political situation of India, the economic situation of India, the social situation of India, including social tensions. These things have to be understood by people who are going to be leaders of uh, society in the coming years and they understand that it is their job to bring about the changes. Then I think we can say that business education is fulfilling its real role in developing India.
Thank you very much.